Welcome everyone to Buddha's Center. Uh, my name is Jeff Allen and once again tonight we are looking at Bodhicitta from Pension Andrapa's general meaning of perfection. Uh, so fortunate to be able to look at this text and to be able to see that entrance into the Mahayana in a full way uh, without missing any of the details so that we know if we haven't missed details then we'll have everything that we need to in order to, to become bodhisattvas. Uh, there isn't anything that uh, is left out when we look at it in, in terms of uh, Penchen Sonandrapa's uh, general meaning of perfection, its presentation, and then Lama Tsongkhapa's great treatise on the stage of the path to enlightenment that we constantly uh, reference in order to kind of uh, make it even more beautiful and more understandable. Uh, and then so many other commentaries that we've used and we've looked at uh, uh, Shanti Deva's Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life as an aid and Nanka Pell's uh, mind training like the rays of the sun uh, um, as an aid and just so many of the other texts uh, that we've used as an aid in order for us to kind of understand and clarify uh, this mind that aspires to enlightenment. Oh yes, and uh, Kamala Shila's Stages of Meditation where we find those beautiful definitions of the aspiring and uh, um, engaged mind of bodhicitta. Uh, but before we get started, uh, tonight, uh, we'll get into a specific kind of physical posture that will allow us to have our mind as clear as possible. Uh, it will get us into the habit of being in this posture called the seven-point Virakana posture, uh, so that all of our channels and winds and everything are aligned just perfectly, our blood flows just perfectly, uh, and this position physically will allow us to sit longer and longer periods of time as our mind becomes becomes more uh, able uh, to sit for longer and longer periods of time. Uh, so we get into the seven-point Virakana posture with our legs and cross-legged or, or whatever posture we can get into. Uh, Vajra posture is best, or just cross-legged or feet on the floor, whatever we can do within our physical limitations. We put our right hand on our left uh, in our lap uh, with our thumbs touching, symbolizing the union of method and wisdom. With our back very straight, uh, vertebrae like a stack of coins with our shoulders in a comfortable position, allowing for our arms to kind of make a bow. Uh, head slightly tilted forward, eyes slightly open, pointed at our nose with our mouth in a comfortable position, with our tongue on the top of the roof of the mouth against the teeth. Uh, and we begin to breathe in and out uh, through our nose. Uh, so uh, we'll breathe all the way to the top of the breath, uh, breathing in through our nostrils, uh, filling our lungs and our diaphragm all the way up, and then as we exhale, we count one. Filling our lungs and our diaphragm all the way up, inhaling, as we exhale, we count two. Uh, so we're going to be focused solely on the breath, the breathing in and out of the breath, and we're doing this first just so we can get our minds into a more realistic state. So we're not having all this conceptuality or any kind of uh, sinking. Uh, we're just trying to get our minds into a clear state uh, that's setting a foundation for us to be able to hear prayers uh, and for us to be able to engage in virtue. Uh, so if we're distracted uh, uh, or we're, we're coming in here with some kind of closed-mindedness, um, or if we're uh, not just, you know, f paying attention at all, we're not going to be able to reap the benefits of this. So but by doing the breathing meditation, we get our minds to a reasonable place so that we can hear these teachings and say these prayers and set a motivation uh, that will be beneficial. So we're going to start by breathing in and out uh, through our nose and checking uh, the, as we exhale the number of the breath um, and then uh, making sure we're only focusing on the breathing in and out and the counting of the breath initially.
Now imagine the space in front of you as you're still focusing on the breath, breathing in and breathing out, and counting. Imagine Buddha Shakyamuni, about the height of your thumb, maybe two inches tall, two feet in front of you, beautiful, golden, and radiant, three-dimensional, light body. Imagine that image in front of you as you're breathing in and out and counting the breath. We're so fortunate to hear the teachings of Buddha Shakyamuni, teachings that will allow us to end the origin of our suffering. Now imagine that Buddha Shakyamuni has just been uh, holding on to or the summary of all the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas. And imagine that from Buddha Shakyamuni, all of the the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas then appear in the space in front of you, the merit field. Sometimes you can visualize the merit field all in one, and you can imagine that a whole merit field is in one being. So we imagine that as Buddha Shakyamuni is encompassing the entire merit field, and now we imagine that the whole merit field appears in front of us. All the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas uh, are in the space in front of us. Kensar Geshe Wandak, smiling, so radiant, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, we see Buddha Shakyamuni is still there. We see the, the profound and extensive deeds, lineage, uh, gurus. Uh, we see Maitreya and Manjushri and all the beings in those lineage, and Tilo and Naru in the lineage of blessings. We see all of these holy beings in the space in front of us, all of the 17 Nalanda Pandits all of their offspring, all of those wonderful, wonderful students. Imagine Lama Tsongkhapa, all the incredible beings of the lineages that trickle down to us of Nyingma, Kaju, Sakya, Galupa. All the deities of highest Yoga Tantra, Yoga Tantra, Performance Tantra, and Action Tantra, all in the space in front of you, however you visualize the merit field. All the 35 Buddhas, all the protector deities, Imagine that all of these beings are in the space in front of you and are so happy, so, so, so happy that you're here and you're doing something in, in order to become a Buddha. All the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas only want us to do one thing and that's engage in a pathway which will make us into Buddhas. So imagine that they're all so happy that we're here doing this today. Now imagine that all sentient beings have been led here by you. Imagine that you've now millions and millions and millions, a number you can't even imagine amount of hands are, are emanating or radiating from your body and grabbing all sentient beings in the hell realm, the hungry ghost realm, animal realm, human realm, demigods, God's realm, all sentient beings who are in the six realms of cyclic existence are now assembled here and you're leading them. Uh, you're leading them in prayer. You're leading them in thinking. Uh, you're leading them uh, in order to uh, be able to hear the pure teachings on bodhicitta, which are the only entrance into the Mahayana. So now imagine that all the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas are so, so happy beyond you. Anything you can imagine that bliss just goes over the whole entire merit field now that they see that all sentient beings are assembled here doing exactly what they wish for them to do, and that's engaging in the causes to become Buddhists. So imagine that this bliss then overcomes the entire merit field and that you and all sentient beings that are around you and assembled around you have a white om on your crown uh, symbolizing your body, a red ah at your throat symbolizing your speech, and a blue hum at your heart symbolizing your mind. Uh, so imagine that. Uh, now imagine that all the gurus and buddhas and bodhisattvas, because of the bliss that they're experiencing, start to radiate, emanate light rays and nectars uh, beginning with white light rays and nectars that transform into ohms and snow and shower down on us and all sentient beings. Crowns uh, dissolving into the, the ohm at our, our head and transforming our negative body into pure body. Now imagine that 
The same thing's happening from the bliss of the Gurus, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas. Uh, red light rays and nectars are coming from the Mara field, uh, showering down on us, snowing down on us, uh, and they're transforming into red Oz, uh, and then dissolving into our throats uh, and transforming our impure speech and all sentient beings' impure speech uh, into pure speech. Now imagine that blue light rays and nectars are showering down on us uh, and transforming into homes uh, and dissolving into ours and all sentient beings' hearts where we have the blue home and transforming our impure minds into pure minds. Uh, so we have the white om, red ah, blue home showering down on us uh, and, and we're imagining this is coming from the bliss of the Gurus, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas. White Om transforming our bodies and all sentient beings' bodies into pure bodies. Red Ah transforming our, uh, ours and sentient beings' impure speech into pure speech. Uh, and Blue Homes transforming ours and all sentient beings' minds into pure minds. Uh, so we imagine as this is all occurring, uh, that we begin listening to the Heart Sutra. So today we'll do the Heart Sutra in Tibetan. Um, we receive this transmission many times from Kensar Geshe Wandak in Tibetan, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, so today we'll listen to it in Tibetan. So imagine that you're meditating on uh, the implicit and explicit meaning of the Heart Sutra, understanding that when we hear these things, there's no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, that these statements mean that there is no inherently existent I. It doesn't mean there's no not, there is a, a, the non-existence of an I. Uh, it's merely negating uh, its, its inherent existence, uh, understanding that all things are not truly established because they dependently originate. They have no objective existence. There is only a conventional subjective existence. Uh, and ultimately, uh, they are not truly existent. Uh, so we meditate on this explicit meaning of the Heart Sutra and the implicit meaning of the five paths, the path of accumulation, the path of preparation, the path of seeing, and the path of meditation, and the path of no more learning. So as we listen to this Heart Sutra, imagine that our mind is being transformed uh, um, and into the understanding of these various paths and into the understanding of the Madhyamika Prasangika view of emptiness. Baba Jeraji Barada Jiminim Bajozo Jagagido Bhagavati Praja Baramita Randeya Bhagido Jamdendema Jeraji Barada Jiminim Bhagavamba Jigo Digita Gidu Badujina Jamdem de Jabi Jagabami Rega Longi Gendon Jambo Dan Jajis and Migendon Jambo Dan Daji Jutu de Dite Jamdem de Zamona Wanje Jago Jaji Nandaji Ding and Zila Nyambajazo Yan Dite Jaji Zamba Zamba Jambo Baba Janrezi Wanji Jeraji Bara de Jamba Zamo Juba Nila Namba Najin Bumong Abo de Dalan Ranjin Jetoma Namba Dao then they Sanjiji do sit on them by Jaribu, Janji Zamba Zamba Jambo Baba Janrezi, Wanji Ladi Gijin Mezo, Rijibong, Gala La Jereji Baro, the Jimba Zamo, Juba Jiba Duba Jede Dala Baja, the Gijin Mebadan, Janji Zamba Zamba Jambo Baba Janrezi, Wanju, Gijit on them by Jareda, the Ibu Dadi Gijin Mezo, Jaribu, Rijibong, Rijibong, Gala La Jereji Baro, the Jimba Zamo, Juba Jiba Duba Dede Danaba Daba Jade Pomong Abo de Daja Ranjin Jay Doma Naba Yandaba Jesu Dao Zu Domba O Domani Zuzo Sule Domani Jemayeno Domani Lejan Zujemayeno Dejan Duzo Wadon Duje Don Duje Don Naba Jiba Nandoba Share Buddha Da Dujan Zedum Venides Any Meba Majiba Magaba Jema Meba Jema Janjava Java Meba Gama Meba Share Buddha Da Wena Domani Zume, so me, do jimmy, do jimmy, Nava jimmy, me, 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 no, me, no, me, jimmy, we may, me, zoom, me, drum, me, jimmy, room, me, rage, I made you, me, do me, gum, me, ben, a eejig, a eejig, number, jibby, bother, yum, at a river, me, a river, zipper, me, ben, a gaji, me, gaji, zippy, bother, yum, at do, dejan, do, do, yo, don't go, jan, go, but don't love me, a jimmy, doba, me, ma, doba, yum, at do, a jerry, bird, did the one, a janju, zamba, no, no, ma, me, Jeraji borrowed the Jimbala, then she did the Zemla Jiba, Majin Jabba Medu, Jinji Lale, Jindila, then Yan and Lady Debbie Bajin to do some to Narbam, Shubis, Anjay, Danjay, Jang, Jer, 
Ejeboro de Jembala de Nelana me bayanda bazo bijan judu bango bazan jezo Yeto wana jera jiboro de jiminga Riba jiminga lana me minga Minya badanya minga Dunya jamze rabju jiwa jiminga Mazumbe na denba jiba jade jera jiboro de jiminga Me bate yata on gade gade bara gade bara zanga di bodizo Sharibu janju zembo zembo jembo Deda jera jiboro Baro de Jimba Zama la la baja o de ne jum de ne de ding in zi de vision de janju zamba zamba jambo baba jan rezi wanju la lezo jeja wa jene lezo lezo rigi bonde da jeno rigi bonde da jene jeta du judi demba jen du jera ji baro de Jimba Zama la je baja de de jen jeba nanjan jesu yerang o jum de ne ji de getzi gazi ne tse dan demba jara da di ibu dan janju zamba zamba jambo baba jan rezi Zi wanju dan dam je dan dem be di be go de da da la da mi dan lama i dan je za ji be ji den ye ran de jam den de ji zum ba la nyom ba do do. Gala ju be ne jo dan ba ne ngu je do jo ngai do do jen ju ba bo la ma i bu jen zi. Nizun gan ju zu la ja zi lo aga zum ara ja jan da ra zum ara ebe gansu. Aga zamara de janara zamara embe de ata on gati gati para gati para zan gati buti so Baba gonche zanji gai dembe doji je lobo doji mebo doji jewa doji Dragi baji me dembe je danji je ten gori e so Aga rin dan da je ju je wadan me dun nube jan dan da wadan Don ba jong jin bon zong zong jo ji Tra ji de jan den da de le jo Now we'll read from Lama Tsongkhapa's uh, abbreviated stages of the path. Lama Tsongkhapa, when we look at the Lam Rim teachings, the, the stages of the path to enlightenment teachings that he gave, uh, we can divide them into the three categories of Lam Rims uh, in terms of texts. Uh, we have the Great Treatise on the Stage of the Path to Enlightenment, which is the largest Lam Rim, and when we look at the categories of three. Uh, and then we have the medium stages of the path to enlightenment, which is the medium lamrim. Uh, and then the song of the stages of the path to enlightenment, or the abbreviated stage of the path to enlightenment, lamrim dudun, uh, that Rinpoche taught us many, many times, which is the smallest of all the lamrim. So we'll read that uh, this evening before we start the teachings before the outer mandala offering and refuge prayer. Uh, and this goes through all of the stages of the path and so forth, and it's beautifully written, obviously, uh, because Lama Tsongkhapa wrote it. Uh, and uh, let's listen to these holy words. A Song of the Stages of the Path to Enlightenment by Lama Tsongkhapa. Namo Guru Manjugosha. Homage to the Buddha, supreme of the Shakya clan lineage, whose body is born from million virtues and excellences, whose speech satisfies the hopes of infinite beings, whose mind sees all things as they are. Homage to Maitreya and Manjushri, supreme disciples of the peerless master, bodhisattvas assuming the responsibilities of the Buddha's deeds by magically sending forth emanations in countless realms. Homage to Nagarjuna and Asanga, who are widely famed throughout the three worlds. Ornaments among the commentators who precisely elucidate the mother of the Buddhas, the depth of which is so difficult to fathom. Homage to Dipankara, the holder of quintessential treasury of instructions, consisting of the path of profound view and vast deeds, the sublime lineages of the two great trailblazers. You are the eyes to see all the teachings, the supreme gate to liberation for the fortunate ones. Moved by compassion, you elucidate the Dharma with skillful means. To you, the spiritual masters, I pay homage. Through Nagarjuna and Asanga, banners until all humankind, ornaments amongst the wise ones of the world, was transmitted the sublime Lamrim teachings, fulfilling all aspirations of sentient beings. It is the wish-fulfilling gem, being the confluence of a thousand streams of teachings. It is also an ocean of eloquent speech. 
Through it, all doctrines are perceived as non-contradictory. All teachings arise as personal advice. The intent of the Buddha is swiftly realized. One is protected from the precipice of great negativity. Therefore, the wise and fortunate ones of India and Tibet have relied upon the supreme instruction known as the stages of the path of the three beings, which wise person would not be greatly drawn to it. Even hearing or teaching this tradition just once that embodies the essence of all the Buddha's words gathers waves of merit equal to hearing or teaching all the doctrines of the Buddha. The root of all causes giving rise to happiness now and in the future is relying practice of relying in thought and action upon a genuine spiritual guide who reveals the path. Seeing this, follow them even at the cost of your life and please them with the offering of practice of the teachings. I, a practitioner, did that myself. You, O oh seeker of liberation, should do likewise. This birth of leisure is more precious than a wish-fulfilling gem. Found but once, it is as brief as a flash of lightning. Hard to obtain, it is easily lost. Reflecting thus, realize that worldly activities are merely like the husk of a grain and strive day and night to take its essence. The venerable guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. There is no certainty that after death, lower rebirth does not await. But it is certain that the three jewels have the power to protect you from these fears. Therefore, taking refuge resolutely, do not let the refuge instructions degenerate. By reflecting well on positive and negative karmas and their results, relying on properly, engaging in abandoning negativities and practicing the virtues, uh, the, the Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. Here you'll sometimes see all of this every time read uh, as Lama Tsongkhapa is saying, I, the yogi, have practiced in this manner. If you too seek liberation, you should do likewise. But then it, it, in, in this text, it's changed into it in an aspiration way so that it means more to you as a practitioner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. You, the venerable yogi, practice like this. I, the seeker, will do likewise. So, um, but it usually says, I, the yogi. So Lama Tsongkhapa is saying, I, the yogi, practice this way. Uh, if you would like to seek liberation yourself the way I have, practice the way I have. Um, so just wanted to tell. If you're familiar with the other reading of it, uh, why the words are changed in here, it's changed in terms of how a practitioner would read this uh, and make this aspiration uh, um, in their minds. Um, so, sorry. Uh, there is no certainty that after death, lower rebirth does not await but it is certain that the three jewels have the power to protect you from these fears. Therefore, take refuge re re resolutely. Do not let the refuge instructions degenerate by reflecting well on positive and negative karmas and their results. Rely on properly engaging and abandoning negativities and practicing virtues. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. Should you not find a suitable rebirth, swift progress along the supreme path will not occur. Cultivate its causes in their entirety of vital importance is purification, particularly of karma defilements of the three doors. Tainted by stains of negativities and infractions, relying on the four powers regularly is this thus essential. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. If you do not strive to contemplate the demerits of the truth of suffering, a genuine wish for liberation will not arise. If you do not contemplate the cause of suffering, the door to samsara, knowledge of cutting the root of cyclic existence will not arise. Generating renunciation characterized by a feeling of despondency toward samsara, as well as having knowledge of what binds you to samsara is imperative. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. Bodhicitta is the central pillar of the path of the supreme vehicle. It is the foundation of all the great deeds of bodhisattvas, a gold-making elixir of the two collections. It is a treasure trove of merit for collecting the vast accumulation of virtues. Knowing this, heroic bodhisattvas cherish this process, uh, precious mind as their supreme practice. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. Generosity, the wish-fulfilling gem which satisfies the hopes of beings, is the best weapon to cut the knot of miserliness, and is the bodhisattva deed that gives rise to unfailing determination. It is the basis of the spread of fame throughout the ten directions, realizing this, the wise ones practice the noble path of giving everything, their body, possessions, and virtues. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. Ethical discipline is the water that washes away the stains of negativity, the moonlight that cools the scorching heat of the afflictions, 
elegant like the Mount Meru amongst beings. It is the power before which all beings bow, uh, minds free from fear. Realizing this, noble ones protect the vows they have received as they would their very eyes. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. Patience, the supreme ornament for the powerful, is an exemplary fortitude amongst the torment of afflictions. A guru to destroy the enemy of the snake of hatred. It is in pain penetrable shield against the weapon of harsh words. Realizing this, familiarize yourself in every way with the armor of supreme patience. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner, I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. By donning the armor of unrelenting, stable perseverance, qualities of learning and realization increase like the waxing moon. All actions become meaningful. All work embarked upon reaches fruition as intended. Realizing this, the Bodhisattvas dispel indul indolence and engage with intense perseverance. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. Meditative concentration is a sovereign that rules the mind. When stabilized, it stands unwavering like the king of mountains. When directed, it engages all virtuous objects, giving rise to the great bliss that makes the body and mind pliant. Realizing this and always resorting to meditative concentrations, great yogis dispel the enemy of mental wandering. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. Wisdom is the eye to see the profound reality, the means to pull out samsara's root, the treasure of excellences praised in all scriptures. Supreme lamp that dispels the darkness of ignorance, realizing this, the wise seeking freedom, strive to generate it. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. The power to cut samsara's root lies not in single-pointed concentration alone. However deeply analyzed, wisdom devoid of the path of calm abiding reverses not the delusions. Wisdom that precisely discerns reality should ride the horse of unwavering calm abiding and use the sharp weapon of Madhyamaka reasoning devoid of extremes to completely destroy all references of grasping at extremes with this expansive insight that unerringly analyzes the wisdom realizing reality will flourish. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. What need is there to mention that single-pointed meditation accomplishes samadhi? Seeing that proper analysis grounded on discretion also gives rise to very stable samadhi, but that which unwavering focuses on reality, amazing are those who strive to achieve the union of calm abiding and special insight. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. Praise be to you who meditate on space-like emptiness during meditative equipose and illusion-like emptiness during post-meditation. Through this union of method and wisdom, you reach the culmination of the Bodhisattva's deeds. Realizing this, not remaining complacent over incomplete paths is a tradition of the fortunate ones. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. Having properly generated the path required by both the excellent causal and resultant Mahayana vehicles, Rely upon the guidance of a wise adept and enter the great ocean of Mantrayana, Mantrayana Tantra, embracing the pith of the instructions in their entirety, giving meaning to this birth of leisure that you have attained. The Venerable Guru practiced in this manner. I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. In order to acquaint my mind with this path and also to benefit other fortunate beings, I have here and explained in simple terms the complete path that pleases the Buddhas. I pray that by the power of this virtue, all sentient beings are never separated from the sublime, noble path. The Venerable Guru prayed in this manner, I, the seeker of liberation, will do likewise. And some additional prayers from Lama Tsongkhapa students. Through the kindness of my Guru, I met with the teachings of the unexcelled guide. May this virtue be dedicated towards all beings being guided by noble Gurus. Whichever pure land it may be, such as Tashita or Sukhavati, where Venerable Lozan Drapa, my teacher, resides, may that be the place where others and I are born as his very first disciples. Initially strive to gain vast learning. In the middle, all teachings are reflected as pith instructions. In the end, practice diligently day and night. Dedicate all virtues to the proliferation of the Dharma. We'll make an outer mandala offering, a request for teaching. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. Holy Lamas, high, wrap the sky of your Dharma bodies in massive clouds of knowledge and love. 
and let them pour upon the earth of your disciples as we are ready, a shower of rain, the teachings deep and wide. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious Guru. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merit I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merit I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merit I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Now, if you're teaching the Dharma, you say the merit I create by teaching the Dharma, but to lead it, I read uh, listening to the Dharma. The one who is transformed into the reliable guide, motivated to, by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teacher, Sugata, and protector to you, I make prostrations. The one who has eliminated the web of conceptualizations and endowed with the divine bodies of vast and profound, who eternally shines forth the forever noble light rays to you, the Buddha, I make prostrations. All phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata. The cessation of causes as well are taught by the great seer. If you are attached to this life, you are not a spiritual practitioner. If you are attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you are attached to your own self-interest, you have no bodhicitta. If there is grasping, you do not have the view. May this teaching be heard and understood in the language of all beings. Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, so great to see all of you again. Um, I, it's exciting to be able to, you know, even like touch uh, this topic of bodhicitta a little bit um, uh, by looking at Pension Sonandrapa's general meaning of perfection. Um, we know we'll have all of the tools uh, and the understanding that'll be necessary for us to engage in this pathway. Um, so, uh, what are the various categories that Pension Sanandrapa chooses to explain bodhicitta uh, in? Uh, so, we know that bodhicitta is the entrance into the Mahayana. Uh, it's the only thing uh, that will allow us to become a Buddha. Uh, it's what makes us into a bodhisattva once we generate the aspiring mind of bodhicitta. Uh, and we know uh, that it is the bodhisattva that goes through the path of accumulation and path of preparation, uh, path of seeing uh, um, and path of meditation to the path of no more le learning that allows uh, him or her to become a Buddha. Um, if they had gone through the five paths of the hearer of the solitary realizer, they would not be able to be a Buddha. Uh, they'd only be able to achieve an abiding nirvana. Um, and uh, what is the difference? Um, and, and if they're only able to achieve an abiding nirvana, um, that means that they're missing something, right? There's something incomplete, because I said only able to. Uh, so what's wrong? Uh, they haven't fulfilled their own needs or all sentient beings' needs because they still have obstructions to omniscience. Uh, so even if they had gone through the five paths of the hero solitary realizer, uh, those five paths, they start... Uh, instead of with bodhicitta, they start with renunciation. So that renunciation, when it doesn't have that bodhicitta, blows the hearer, solitary realizer into the nirvana, uh, um, uh, the abiding nirvana, um, right, uh, without remainder. It blows them into that. Um, whereas if you generate the mind that aspires to enlightenment, bodhicitta, uh, that is the first path of the five paths for the Mahayana practitioner, uh, that bodhicitta wind blows the practitioner when it's mixed with wisdom uh, into Buddhahood um, and, and allows that practitioner to get rid of not only the afflictive obscurations, the afflictive obstructions um, that the here and solitary realizer uh, is able to get rid of through renunciation and wisdom, but also the cognitive obscurations or the um, obstructions to omniscience um, that uh, that 
are, uh, are what uh, the here in solitary realizer hasn't gotten rid of and is incomplete because of, uh, whereas the bodhisattva path, uh, that wind mixed with emptiness of bodhicitta allows the practitioner to become a Buddha and remove not only the cognitive obstructions, but the obstructions to omniscience. So, um, so the categories the Pension Sun and Drapa goes over are five. Uh, base, uh, so what kind of base would be necessary uh, physical and mentally, uh, physically and mentally in order to get bodhicitta? And it says there are the two kinds, aspiring bodhicitta and engaged bodhicitta. We went over that very clearly. Uh, causes uh, of bodhicitta is the second category. Uh, we went through that in great detail. We went over the general causes, uh, and then we went over the specific causes. Uh, so we went over that in detail. And in and there, we found the beautiful instruction of the seven-point cause and effect for realizing the mind that aspires to enlightenment uh, that was passed down uh, from Maitreya to Asanga and eventually through Salimpa uh, to Lord Atisha uh, and then through beautiful lineage uh, to us. Um, and then we learned about the equalizing and exchanging self with others practice that comes from the beautiful, profound view lineage passed down from uh, um, Manjushri to Nagarjuna uh, um, to Shantideva and such masters uh, of that lineage uh, and eventually to Sarlimpa and then to Atisha and then holy, holy beings to us, uh, that equalizing, exchanging self with others practice. All practices, equalizing, exchanging self with others practice, pra passed down from the profound view lineage uh, and the seven point cause and effect instruction for realizing the mind that aspires to enlightenment uh, lineage. Um, passed down in the extensive deeds lineage, all of these are from Buddha Shakyamuni. So Buddha Shakyamuni to Maitreya in terms of the extensive deeds, uh, and, Buddha, Buddha, and Buddha Shakyamuni to uh, Manjushri uh, in terms of the profound view lineage. Okay, so uh, that was the specific root causes for generating the mind that aspires to enlightenment. So we went over that in great detail. Uh, then we looked at nature, uh, it was really just defining uh, what uh, the nature or the definition of this great vehicle mind generation would be. Uh, we landed on that it's a, con it's a consciousness, a main mind, a main mind, it's a mind, uh, which is the entrance to the great vehicle. Uh, so we know it's the door into the Mahayana and it's arisen in association with a wish. Uh, so there's a, a, a wishing and a factor, a mental factor there, which aids it. Uh, that aims at the perfect enlightenment for the sake of, of all sentient beings. Uh, so uh, we had the definition of nature, uh, uh, the definition of the great vehicle mind generation in there. Uh, and when we look at what the real, uh, you know, abbreviated definition is, um, um, is wishing uh, to, to become enlightened for the sake of all sentient beings. If we look at the Abhisama Alamkara, if we were to just shorten or summarize uh, um, what the definition of bodhicitta is, or the mind that aspires to enlightenment, uh, we would say that everyone concurs that in the Abhisama Alamkara, Maitreya's ornament for clear realization, uh, that the definition is, uh, you know, wishing for enlightenment for the sake of all beings, right? Wanting to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. Um, uh, so this just kind of Pension Sun and Drop expands a little bit on it. Uh, and then we find in the text, uh, you know, quotations from, uh, the guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life that come up and the, and then the, um, Kamala Shila's, uh, middle and stages of meditation that come up, uh, where we kind of can, can, can understand it even more, uh, as we go through these, this later sections, we see how Shanti Davis says that, you know, there's two kinds of bodhicitta, as we know, aspiring and engaged. And and uh, and Shanti Davis says the aspiring bodhicitta is like planning on going somewhere, and the engaged bodhicitta is like actually going there. Uh, and then in Kamala Shila's stages of meditation, it says that um, how do we tell what aspiring and engaged is? Aspiring bodhicitta is when we have this kind of thought come into our mind: May I become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings? This initial generation. Uh, that comes from renunciation, as we know, uh, this generation that occurs day and night where you're wishing to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings, that initial generation is the aspiring bodhicitta. Uh, and then Kamala Shila says that when that aspiring mind is mixed with a vow, the bodhisattva vow, and then a practice of the six perfections, uh, then this becomes engaged bodhicitta. Uh, 
Um, so we learned all about that in the previous teachings, and we learned that the aspiring bodhicitta happens at the path, the Mahayana path of accumulation, uh, and then the engaged bodhicitta uh, does as well. But when we look at the Mahayana path of accumulation, there's three different levels, small, medium, and great. Uh, and we know that it's, a, it's at that uh, second level uh, of the path of accumulation where the bodhisattva vow occurs, and that is always then from there on engaged bodhicitta uh, in according to our view. Um, so uh, enough about that. Now we get into divisions. Um, so divisions. Uh, so there's this is a little bit technical, but we're we're not going to spend a lot of time getting like drowning in weeds of technicality. We're going to just make sure that we have a, a good overview or understanding of what all of this means, um, because that's what's most important. So division. We have division of individual nature of door. So. Uh, so we have these doors. What are the divisions of the individual nature of the door, entrance to the Mahayana? The range of division of door, division of purpose of door, and examples concordant with division of door. Okay. Um, so the first category, a division of individual nature of door. Um, so we have the individual natures of the doors, right? Um, so what are the terminological divisions uh, of door? Um, and then it says uh, the the and the division of door of mode of being. Um, so the first, when we look at uh, the, the terminological division of door, we'd say there are the doors of the conventional uh, mind generation uh, and ultimate mind generation, or conventional bodhicitta uh, and ultimate bodhicitta. Um, so let's, let's look at these t uh, two different things. So conventional bodhicitta is the bodhicitta that we're talking about, the great vehicle mind generation, uh, which is a consciousness which is the entrance to the great vehicle arisen in association with a wish, which is its own aid that aims at the perfect enlightenment for the sake of others. Um, so we could say, okay, that would be the conventional bodhicitta. Um, if we were to say, posit that which is conventional bodhicitta, we could say um, just this general bodhicitta def definition. Um, uh, and then we could say also, if we wanted to be specific, uh, we could say conventional bodhicitta is uh, aspiring bodhicitta or engaged bodhicitta. Aspiring bodhicitta would be uh, uh, um, uh, this consciousness, which is the entrance to the great vehicle arisen in association with a wish that aims at perfect enlightenment uh, for the sake of all sentient beings uh, without a vow <laughs> would be the aspiring bodhicitta. And then that same definition adding it with a vow, and then the practice of the six uh, perfections would be the uh, conventional and engaged bodhicitta. Uh, so these would be, the conventional bodhicitta is the bodhicitta that we always think about, you know, all these different types of bodhicitta. Ultimate bodhicitta, so what is this? <laughs> this gets a little bit more technical. Um, maybe you just need to sit with this also. We're not gonna get into like the super, super details of it, um, but let's let's look at what it is. So ultimate um, bodhicitta or ultimate mind generation, first of all, isn't it technically bodhicitta. Um, difficult to understand, but I think it'll make sense in a minute. Um, because it's when a bodhisattva is seeing emptiness directly, the, that bodhicitta that's there is what we're talking about. And when we, we, we know that the object of observation of that is non-conceptual, direct perception of emptiness, right? Uh, so they're not perceiving that I want to be a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings in this kind of forefront because there's no conceptuality. So when the bodhisattva is seeing emptiness directly, right? They still have bodhicitta. They're still bodhisattvas. They still have engaged bodhicitta. Um, but their perception at that time is of the nature of reality. It isn't of anything else. There's no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, right? There's just the lack of inherent existence of reality. It's the, the so the the so that's what is being observed, like the the um, the lack of inherent existence of a phenomena. So at that point in time, it's a principal consciousness uh, in the continuum of a great vehicle superior. So here, so it's qualifying it. It's saying a Mahayana practitioner who's an Arya. So it's in the continuum of an Arya, someone who's seeing, you know, an Arya is someone who's seen emptiness directly. You become an Arya or a superior in English when you reach the path of seeing. As soon as you see emptiness directly, 
uh, and you go through the various paths of the non-interrupted path and the path of release, et cetera, et cetera. It's details uh, that happen. You're in this non-conceptual direct perception of emptiness that's not interrupted. So your bodhicitta isn't interrupting it. <laughs> your mind, may I become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings that you're thinking about day and night, even when you're sleeping, isn't interrupting your direct perception of emptiness. But you're still a bodhisattva, just like when you're asleep, you can still see you're not blind. You're just, it's not active, activating in that level at that point, right? Uh, so that's like a, a rough way to say it. You know, uh, the great Geshe's would come in here and just start, you know, spinning me around in circles and us around in circles, right? With this kind of idea of ultimate bodhicitta and the bodhisattva realizing emptiness and it's like being asleep, but you can still see you're not blind, right? Um, but this is just an analogy. It's a very, very deep understanding of how one is having a direct perception of emptiness, um, uh, but is a bodhisattva, so they this is ultimate bodhicitta, right? Because uh, the bodhisattva has bodhicitta, um, but this is the ultimate bodhicitta. The ultimate, what is ultimate bodhicitta? It's the direct perception of emptiness. In the mind of a bodhisattva, though. Not the direct perception of emptiness in the mind of a hearer, a solitary realizer. Making sense, right? So, so it's the direct perception of emptiness in a bodhisattva's mind that makes it ultimate bodhicitta. If it was a direct perception of emptiness in a hero solitary realizer's mind, it wouldn't be ultimate bodhicitta because it wouldn't be being experienced by a bodhisattva. Okay? So it's a principal consciousness of the continuum of a great vehicle superior which falls into the category of a great vehicle wisdom in which the dualistic appearance with regard to the mode of subsistence of complete enlightenment has disappeared. <laughs> so if you don't have the mode of Subsistence of complete enlightenment, how can you be thinking, may I become a Buddha? Right? How can you be thinking, may I become a Buddha, if the mode of subsistence of, of enlightenment itself has vanished because you're experiencing the non-inherent existence of reality at that moment? So your goal, I may I become a Buddha? <laughs> right? Like that, you know, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no Buddha. <laughs> Not no existence, right? You know, we, we have to be careful and we're trying to ride that line, you know? Um, you know, uh, dependent origination, emptiness is dependent origination, right? Dependent origination is the middle way. Therefore, emptiness is the middle way. What's the middle way? The middle way between the extremes of nihilism and its substantialism. So the lack of true establishment, this emptiness that the Bodhisattva is witnessing, this lack of objective exist existence of reality that the Bodhisattva is recognizing, the emptiness of even the subjective existence of phenomena, right? This emptiness that the, the Bodhisattva is, is recognizing, this clear light, um, is uh, the ultimate bodhicitta. Um, so, so that's the definition in Penjan Sonandrapa's text. And it says, having served in the Mahayana Sutra Alamkara, uh, um, by Lord Maitreya, it says, having served the perfect Buddhas, having accumulated the collection of exalted wisdom and merit, having produced the non-conceptual exalted wisdom in regards to phenomena, that is asserted to be the ultimate. Right? Uh, the non-conceptual exalted wisdom in regards to phenomena. You know? the emptiness of the I in all phenomena, the lack of inherent existence of the I in all phenomena, the bodhisattva who is seeing the lack of objective existence, the lack of the arisal from self, from other, from both, or causelessly, the bodhisattva who is seeing the dependent arising uh, at that moment is seeing the lack of true establishment of all phenomena directly, not through the eyes, through the mind. The mind is having a direct yogic perception. When we look at direct perception, uh, we can have direct perception right through our eyes, right? Uh, um, you know, we, we can see, you know, visual. Um, there's mental direct perceptions that could happen right through clairvoyance or something, like if I could read your mind. Um, not necessarily a great level. <laughs> As Buddhists go, Buddhists, Buddhists are like, yeah, so you can read minds, big deal, right? And then there's the yogic direct perception that only occurs in the minds of Arya beings. Beings, right? Superior beings. Um, and this is one of those cases in that yogic direct perception that's taking place uh, at, that, at that point 
is directly perceiving in a non-conceptual way the nature of reality. It's not relying on, on any kind of generic image or sound generality uh, to, to bring it apart. There's no conceptuality that's requiring it to say things are not truly established because they dependently originate. All of that's vanished and there's direct mental perception, yogic direct perception of emptiness, whatever that would be like. But that's what, that's what the, this, the, these great beings say occurs, right? That there's this, this direct perception that happens at a yogic level um, that an ordinary being uh, can't have, um, that has to be a union of this kind of calm abiding that you've become very, very good at, and this analytical meditation that you become very, very good at, and then the signs vanish, right? And the focus is only on the mind in a non-conceptual direct perception of emptiness. So obviously while you're having that, your bodhicitta changes a little bit because you're, you know, you're saying now the bodhisattva day and night, whether they're sleeping, they're eating, they're collecting virtue because they're thinking about benefiting sentient beings. And now you're saying, what are they thinking about? No eye, no ear. What do you mean? There's no Buddha they're thinking, right? Um, in terms of uh, um, the inherent existence of it. Um, so there isn't any conceptuality to, to hold on to, to say, you know, uh, this is what I'm going for, right? There's no conceptual thing to go for. Uh, there's no sentient beings conceptually uh, to go for um, uh, at that point. So however that all uh, works out. So what are the ranges uh, of this bodhicitta that occurs? Um, uh, so when we're looking at the, now we're talking more of uh, the conventional uh, um, bodhicitta ranges. Um, and and uh, um, so what are the ranges? So there's the, um, so they also, they call it the through demarcation or something. There's another term that we can use uh, for range, uh, a category by way of demarcation, uh, but it means the range of this bodhicitta. So there's the mind generation of engagement through belief that occurs on the path of accumulation and preparation. So you haven't seen emptiness directly, so you still like have some faith-based, this belief, right, uh, that's, that's going on. You're in the learner stage. Um, there's learner stages and superior stages. On the path of accumulation and on the path of preparation, uh, if the bodhisattva isn't of sharp capacity, uh, right, if they haven't already seen emptiness, right, the normal bodhisattva is on a learner stage uh, and is, uh, you know, at those paths. So there's that mind generation. Then there's the mind generation uh, that's uh, an unusual kind that, it, that occurs on the seven impure grounds. Um, so this is the mind generation that's occurring. Uh, when you see emptiness directly, you're on the first bodhisattva ground. So this is talking about the bodhisattva grounds. So the first bodhisattva, seven bodhisattva grounds are considered the impure grounds because there's still afflictive obstructions uh, during those grounds. Now there's a, uh, we can look deeper into this because on this, I believe Rinpoche even taught, but I can't cite it in a text, um, that, that there's a part of the seventh ground where there's a, a going into cessation and a cessation that occurs. Uh, that almost like the second half of the seventh ground is considered, begins this purity. But I believe the eighth ground just occurs. Um, so they call the first seven grounds impure. We can leave that up to the debaters, but I like to, let's throw that in there, right? Let's think about that. So, but they call this seven impure grounds. So uh, this mind generation uh, that is occurring during these uh, first seven bodhisattva grounds, you know, during the uh, um, you know, path of seeing, you see emptiness directly, and then the path of meditation. Um, and as you're going through these bodhisattva grounds, and you know, you're going through the perfections of generosity, the perfections of ethics, the perfections of um, uh, patience and effort and so forth, right? All the 10 bodhisattva grounds, the 10 perfections, uh, and so forth. Um, so, uh, so that's number two, the seven impure grounds. And number three, the bodhicitta, the, the completely ripened mind generation, it's saying, because there's no more afflictive obstructions at this point. At this point, you have the same realizations as a, a here solitary realizer in terms of abandonments, uh, who's in nirvana. <laughs> so those here's and solitary realizers who are in nirvana, the bodhisattva has that level of fearlessness at that po this point. Um, at the eighth bodhisattva ground. They have no more um, afflictive uh, uh, obscurations, afflictive obstructions. So uh, those are removed, um, but their love and compassion doesn't 
throw them into nirvana uh, and, and make them stuck there and abiding in it. They're, you know, so it doesn't, it doesn't then thrust them into that. Their, their love and compassion, those bodhisattva grounds that they practiced for the sake of all sentient beings, forces them to not go to nirvana at that point on those pure grounds. Uh, and then purify the remaining obstructions to omniscience. Um, so those pure grounds, this number three category is this mind generation that's going on in those three pure grounds. Um, and then number four is the mind generation <clears throat> at the level of Buddhahood where the obstructions have been abandoned completely. So there's no more, what does that mean, right? The Buddha has no more, he's at the path of no more learning. He no longer has not only the afflictive obstructions or the afflictive obscurations, but has also gotten rid of the cognitive obscurations or the obstructions to omniscience. Um, so that mind, that, that mental state for the, that's for, for the sake of all beings, right? At the, at the level of a Buddha. So Penchen Sun Andrapa says there are these four levels um, of this mind that's generated uh, in, in a being. Those who are bodhisattvas on the learner's paths, those bodhisattvas who are on the um, superior paths of the seven impure grounds, those bodhisattvas on the superior paths of the three last pure grounds, uh, and then the bodhis and then the, the Buddha's mind generation. What's the mental state of that Buddha's mind generation? Four categories. Those are the range. Uh, so then. Uh, we get into divisions. Um, so this is a, a great category uh, that isn't so hard. <laughs> not so easy either. Not so uh, harder to realize, easier to talk about than ultimate bodhicitta. Um, so uh, what are some divisions of bodhicitta? Um, these are good to know. Because it's really, when you look at these divisions, we see a, how a lot of confusion about bodhisattvas occurs. Uh, so let's interpret it and let's take a look at it. Let's see what we got here. Um, so what are some divisions? So there's the shepherd-like bodhicitta. Uh, we've heard of it like the bodhicitta like a herdsman. Uh, this is the bodhicitta that says that, that I, um, uh, I will bring all sentient beings to a state of enlightenment. I'll, I'll remain in samsara. <laughs> I'm going to, as a bodhisattva, this is the kind of bodhicitta it ha I have. I'm going to herd all sentient beings, you know, I'm going to stay here in cyclic existence and I'm going to bring all sentient beings to a state of Buddhahood and then I'll hop in <laughs> when I get them all there. So this is a kind of bodhi, bodhicitta. Let's not comment on it until we get done. Second kind of bodhicitta, bodhicitta that's like an oarsman. Uh, this is also now called fairy-like bodhicitta. <laughs> okay, so this is a bodhicitta that says, I'm going to put everybody in the boat with me and we're all going to head to enlightenment and we're going to do it simultaneously. Okay? Uh, so somehow I'm going to gather you all up like an, a good fairy, you know, boat driver. I'm going to get all sentient beings as a bodhisattva onto this boat and I'm going to bring you all on this ferry with myself and we're all going to simultaneously uh, achieve Buddhahood. We're going to do it together. We're going to achieve Buddhahood together. Second kind of bodhicitta. Third bodhicitta is the king-like bodhicitta. Uh, this is the bodhicitta that says, I have, will first achieve Buddhahood uh, in order to lead all sentient beings uh, to a state of enlightenment. Uh, so it says that, that I want to uh, become a Buddha as quickly as possible, first. Uh, so this word first is used. Um, so, you know, uh, is that in some selfish way? No, it's saying like, I've got to get there as quickly as possible uh, because I am not reliable at this point. Uh, I am not a Buddha. I'm like that person with all the broken bones laying on the ground next to another person laying on the ground with broken bones, uh, whispering in their ear that, Oh, I'm going to save you. I'm going to lift you up and carry you into the other room, I promise. <laughs> right now, I'm not capable of helping sentient beings. I have to become a Buddha uh, in order to do that. Um, and anything that I do before I'm a Buddha, uh, I'm going to be a little bit incompetent, you know. Um, even if I'm at the higher bodhisattva levels, I'm going to be missing a little something or the bodhisattva would stop. 
right? The Bodhisattva doesn't stop because they can't be missing anything because they're, like I said, if there are sentient beings that uh, even hearers and solitary realizers in nirvana can't comprehend because there's a number that we can't even count and then there's numbers that they can't, there's, you know, numbers that, that we can't count that they can count, but then there's numbers that they can't count that Buddhists can count. Uh, so there's, we're looking at these high realizations that bodhisattvas have, and they're still missing beings, right? They're m missing beings that they have to help in order uh, to, to really fulfill all of their needs and sentient beings' needs. Uh, the word all is there. And if any sentient beings are missing, uh, then the bodhisattvas' wishes uh, aren't being fulfilled. Uh, so the bodhisattva sees, I must become a Buddha in order to fulfill my wishes, really. Um, so why are these other bodhicittas mentioned? Because you have all these traditions now that say, well, bodhisattvas are beings that just hang out in samsara, right? As soon as you say, I want to become a Buddha, and you start doing social work, you're a bodhisattva. And you don't want to become a Buddha because that's selfish. And you stay in this world because the most selfless thing is to suffer in this world and, and work for others' needs and get them out first because that's what a selfless person would do. Someone who's selfish would, would get there and want the, you know, their nirvana first. There's a misunderstanding of abiding and non-abiding nirvana. They don't understand that the Buddha is the most reliable guide. They don't understand. They think that the Buddha is stuck. And the bodhisattva is down here doing the Buddha's job. <laughs> the Buddha, they don't understand that the Buddha can emanate. The Buddha doesn't need a go-between. The Buddha is the most reliable emanator, not the bodhisattva emanator. Even the bodhisattva can emanate. They're emanating so that they can gather more and more merit and more and more wisdom and more and more compassion so they can become a Buddha. <laughs> so we have to understand that. So why would these other things be divisions? Because a bodhisattva says in there, they have such an incredible mind. They have so much love and compassion for other beings. They cherish others more than themselves. So they have these levels of thought that they'd be willing to, if that would, was what it would take to be the most helpful, they'd be willing to. I as a bodhisattva, if I was a bodhisattva, I'd say I'd be willing to stay here until samsara is empty for the sake of others. So it's this mind. I'd be willing to do that. Would that be the wisest thing for all sentient beings? If I did that? No. I don't even know how that even works. <laughs> right? It starts to become mathematically very difficult if you start to say, okay, I'm going to wait till they're all, you know, how do you do it? And how am I helping them? Someone's got to help me. Right, <laughs> right, because I'm now I'm still contaminated if I haven't become a Buddha, right? Um, so it starts to become quite difficult to figure out how that would even work, and uh, you know why someone would think that made sense. But the Bodhisattva would be willing, if that's what it would take, for the sake of everyone, they would do that, uh, and they would say, you know, even if I could get there quicker, I have non-biased. We learned about non-biased. What did we learn about the first step for equalizing and exchanging self with others? You're equally as important to me. We'll all go on the boat together. All of these bodhicittas are just full of these intentions that you've made. I'm willing to do anything for all sentient beings, no matter how much I have to suffer. I'm willing to endure the hardships of the bodhisattva path. We read that as a condition that was going to be necessary, uh, in, a cause or a condition that was going to be necessary for us to be able to generate the mind that aspires to enlightenment. You know, uh, so I would be willing to endure those hardships. I would be willing to wait if I had to, to get bliss, to fulfill mine and all sentient beings' needs. If that's what it meant to fulfill your needs, I can't fulfill my needs unless I fulfill your needs. So it's very interesting. So you'd say, I'm willing to endure the hardships, whatever it'll take. I'll empty samsara and I'll wait. If that's what it'll take. And then you go to this next thing and you say, I'm, all beings are equally important. I'm equally as important, <laughs> right? I'm a being. Let's all go together. 
You know, we're all equally important. I, I've, I know that the Buddhahood is the only place where I can experience complete fearlessness and infinite happiness and bliss. The only place that you can experience fearlessness and infinite happiness and bliss. So I'll bring you all together because I'm we're all equally important, right? Uh, so these are trainings that you've done in preliminary stages in order to get to bodhicitta and as you're a bodhisattva. So these are things that are ingrained in the mind. But the bodhisattva recognizes that the only way they can be completely reliable because they took refuge before they even thought about becoming bodhisattvas. They established that the Buddha was the capital T teacher. Right? They established that through reasoning and analysis and established that that was the one. This was the only one that would be my protector. Right? So then it establishes in your mind that the only one who I can feel safe as is the Buddha. Because I can only feel safe um, if I know I'm bringing all sentient, fulfilling all sentient beings' needs. Because that's my aim, is to fill my needs and all sentient beings' needs. And I can only feel safe if I'm a Buddha. I can only feel that I'm really doing that if I'm a Buddha. Um, so that's why it's called king like bodhicitta, because it's the king, it's the real bodhicitta. A lot of debates that'll go on that would say, like, you know, you know, why would a bodhisattva even think that? And it's because of the explanation that I've given. Um, and a whole bunch more, right? Uh, but there's some of it, right, uh, of the explanation that I've given. So there are these three kinds of bodhicitta, um, and we can, uh, those are mentioned in Pension Sanandrapa's text. Um, and then also we can look at um, the different levels in the um, Abhisama Alamkara, right? Uh, so the root text, let's go back, just pedal backwards for a second. We're in Penchen Sanandrapa's general meaning of perfection. Penchen Sanandrapa's general meaning of perfection is a commentary on Matraya's ornament for clear realization, the Abhisama Alamkara. Matreya's ornament for clear realization is a commentary on the perfection of wisdom sutras, the 100,000 verse, 20,000 verse, 8,000 verse heart sutra. So I thought it auspicious tonight we recite the heart sutra in Tibetan, the heart sutra. If we look at it as the root text for Matreya's ornament, for, is the condensed right version of the 100,000 verse perfection of wisdom sutra. So the Heart Sutra is the condensed version of the 100,000 verse Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. Lord Maitreya's Abhisama Alamkara, the ornament for clear realization, is a commentary on the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras in all of their expansive and, and uh, summarized fashions. Penchen Sanandrapa's text, the general meaning of perfection, is the general meaning of the Abhisama Alamkara. It's a commentary on Maitreya's Abhisama Alamkara, the ornament for clear realization, which is a commentary on the perfection of wisdom sutras. The general meaning of perfection. See what I mean? See, you see how the, the, the titles connect, right? Uh, so, um, so in the Abhisama Alamkara, there are the similes of... Um, the mind that aspires to enlightenment. So we have different ways, right? We have the three different kinds, the, you know, the, the, the bodhicitta that's like an oarsman or, or a shepherd or bodhicitta that's like a king. Uh, and then we have these different 22 levels of bodhicitta uh, you, will, you will hear about. Um, um, and we'll go through them just by name uh, real quickly. And then there's so many commentaries on Basically, these go through all of the five paths in 22 different levels, including the Buddha grounds, like including the resultant, uh, um, the resultant level of the Buddha. And we see that, um, you know, it says the mind generation uh, at the level of Buddhahood where the obstructions are abandoned, that fourth level. Um, so this goes all the way from the path accumulation to that in terms of uh, the similes or aspects of bodhicitta. Um, so maybe sometime we can uh, have Geshe Aga 
uh, give us a complete teaching on that. We'll ask him for it from the Abhisama Alamkara. Uh, maybe that'd be neat. So, but we'll go through the the um, the twenty two similes, and and you'll uh, I, I'll I'll just give you a little taste of what it's like, right? So first is earth like bodhicitta, right? Uh, so why would it be earth? The ground, <laughs> the aspiring bodhicitta arises, right? Uh, bodhicitta endowed with aspiration. So it's like the earth. Uh, then it goes to gold-like bodhicitta. Um, the gold-like bodhicitta um, is the bodhicitta that can't be lost. Uh, once you, so when you first have the aspiring bodhicitta, right? Uh, you can, it can't be lost. Uh, I, I'm sorry, once you get the aspiring bodhicitta at the path of accumulation, it can be lost. Um, but then you take the bodhisattva vow and you get to the middle level of the path of accumulation and it can't be lost. Here, this gold-like bodhicitta is that gold uh, that stays that way. Gold stays like gold. Whether it's melted down, then it'd be still gold. Uh, so um, now, now, no matter what, the bodhicitta stays bodhicitta. Then moon-like bodhicitta, fire-like bodhicitta, um, treasure like uh, bodhicitta, a jewel mine like bodhicitta, ocean like bodhicitta, vajra like bodhicitta, mountain like bodhicitta, medicine like bodhicitta, spiritual friend like bodhicitta, wish fulfilling gem like bodhicitta, sun like bodhicitta, song like bodhicitta, king like bodhicitta, storehouse like bodhicitta, great path like bodhicitta, riding mount like bodhicitta, uh, spring like bodhicitta, pleasant sound like bodhicitta, River-like bodhicitta and cloud-like uh, bodhicitta. Um, so we'll just say those names for now. So they bless our mind with these 22 levels of bodhicitta. Uh, and understand that we're talking about uh, all of these mind generations that happen from the path of accumulation up to the, the Buddha uh, grounds, the resultant um, grounds of Buddhahood. Um, so um, those are some ways that we can uh, chop up <laughs> the mind that aspires to enlightenment. And then, of course, this, you know, divisions we have going back to the beginning, aspiring bodhicitta and engaged bodhicitta. Aspiring bodhicitta, uh, may I become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings, right? May I become enlightened for the sake of, of, of all sentient beings. Uh, and then this mind that is a basis, right, that, that day and night wants to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings, that then takes the Bodhisattva vow uh, and becomes uh, um, an engaged Bodhisattva and stays engaged Bodhisattva uh, up until Buddhahood uh, and has engaged Bodhicitta um, and is an engaged Bodhisattva while he or she is seeing emptiness. <laughs> so it stays, that's another tricky part, right? So it's engaged Bodhicitta, it's a not aspiring Bodhicitta, because the Bodhisattva has now taken the Bodhisattva vow. Once you take the Bodhisattva vow, he or she stays an engaged Bodhisattva. Their Bodhicitta stays engaged Bodhicitta. Now they're seeing emptiness directly. Now they have ultimate Bodhicitta happening. You know, what, what's there, right? Um, are they still a Bodhisattva? Are they still an engaged Bodhisattva? This is stuff you have to sort, sort out uh, in your own practice, right? And start to refine more and more and more. But I think we gave a pretty good uh, description of how it could all make sense, how a Bodhisattva could be having a non-conceptual understanding of emptiness and simultaneously still be a Bodhisattva, not be because, you know, like a person who's sleeping, saying that that person's blind because they're not seeing anything. Um, so anyway... Uh, that's enough about those categories and now we get to benefit and we'll do that next time. Um, I think that's a good place to stop. Benefit is the uh, uh, final category. Um, going back, let's look back at the, uh, make sure we didn't miss anything. What are the five categories Pension Sonandrapa says are uh, how we explain bodhicitta? Base, cause, nature, divisions and benefits. So we've gone over four, you know, I don't know how many classes we're in, you know, more than two dozen about bodhicitta, I think, possibly, maybe wrong. Uh, I, I don't think I am. Uh, and uh, now we'll get to benefit. And we're going to deep dive benefits of bodhicitta next time uh, using Shantideva and all of the great masters works. Uh, and we know that the Buddha's uh, you know, said that the bodhicitta is the principal mind. You know, they all agree. You know, the omniscient beings all agree that the bodhicitta is that principal mind uh, that that transforms everything that we do uh, into a, a cause for Buddhahood. And uh, I, I think that uh, it's so beautiful that we know uh, more and more about it. So 
Uh, with that in mind, let's just do a quick, uh, um, not even five minute meditation. Uh, and then if anybody has any questions, uh, and uh, uh, then we'll do the dedication prayers and so forth. Uh, so now we're still sitting how in the Virakana posture. We'll go through that again. Uh, getting our mind into a focused place. Let's start thinking that since beginningless time, let's go through the bodhicitta meditation. Since beginningless time, we've had every single sentient being, every relationship with every sentient being. They've been our friends. Friends, they've been our enemies, they've been our neutrals. Let us be equally willing to benefit all of them. We've had every relationship with all of them. All sentient beings have been so kind and dear to us. Since beginningless time, we've had every relationship with them. They've taken care of us when we were so vulnerable. When no one else in the world was there for us, they were there to take care of us, our mothers, our fathers our closest loved ones. Think about those times when you were so vulnerable. Every sentient being has had that relationship with us, has been so kind and dear to us. Remember how kind they were. Remember the things that they did for us that no one else would have done for us. We wish to repay that kindness in some way. We know that we've meditated on suffering. We understand that all happiness and cyclic existence is contaminated and is necessarily the suffering of change. So we wish to give them something more. What could we do to repay the kindness of all mother sentient beings? We recognize that all beings are equally important. You are as important as I am. You want happiness just like I want happiness. You don't want suffering just like I don't want suffering. Your pain feels painful just like my happiness feels happy and my pain feels painful uh, um, in the same way. Your pain and my pain feels the same pain. Your happiness and my happiness feels the same way. You have Buddha nature, I have Buddha nature. We're both equally important. There's no inherently existent I. I arise in dependence upon other. Think about the negativities of cherishing yourself. All the sufferings that happen in the world because of the self-cherishing attitude. Think of all the benefits of cherishing others. Think of all how wonderful beings are that cherish others. Think about how much happiness you get from cherishing others. Imagine that you're taking on all sentient beings suffering, hell, hungry goes to animal, Humans, demigods, gods, friends, neutrals, and enemies, all beings in an unbiased way, imagine that you're taking on their suffering. Imagine that you're giving them all of your happiness. Imagine that you've decided that you will put their needs before your own. They've been so kind to you. Everything that you enjoy, all the wonderful things that you have in your life are because of other sentient beings. We depend so much on others. They've been so kind to us. It's incredible. I'll take on myself the task of bringing all sentient beings to a state of happiness that's free from suffering. And we recognize that we're not capable of doing that. We know who the reliable guide is. We say to ourselves, may I become Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. May I become a Buddha, a fully enlightened one, for the sake of all sentient beings. May I become Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. The Eight Verses for Training the Mind by Geshe Langritamba with the determination to accomplish the highest welfare of all sentient beings who surpass even a wish-granting jewel. I will learn to hold them supremely dear. Whenever I associate with others, I will learn to think of myself as the lowest amongst all. 
and respectively hold others to be supreme from the very depths of my heart. In all actions, I will learn to search into my mind, and as soon as a disturbing emotion arises, endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. I will learn to cherish ill-natured beings and those oppressed by strong misdeeds and sufferings as if I had found a precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, I will learn to take all loss and offer victory to them. When the one whom I benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, I will learn to offer to everyone everywhere, without exception, all help and happiness directly and indirectly and respectfully take upon myself all the harm and suffering of my mothers. I will learn to keep all those practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly concerns and by understanding all phenomena as like illusions be released from the bondage of attachment. Now we'll make a mandala offering as a thanksgiving for teaching. All the gurus, buddhas, and bodhisattvas, imagine the space in front of us. Kensu Geshe Wanak, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Buddha Shakyamuni, Profound View Lineage, Extensive Deeds Lineage, Tilo Naru, Tantric Lineage, all the great beings in the space in front of you, and imagine that all sentient beings are around you making this mandala offering of a perfect universe to the teacher in the lineage. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. I dedicate whatever virtues I have collected for the benefit of the teachings and of all sentient beings, and in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Lozandrapa to shine forever. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious Guru. If you are attached to this life, you are not a spiritual practitioner. If you are attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you are attached to your own self-interest, you have no bodhicitta. If there is grasping, you do not have the view. I dedicate all this virtue to emulate the knowledge of the hero Manjushri and likewise Samantabhadra as well. With whatever dedication is praised as supreme by all the conquerors who traverse the three times, I also dedicate all my roots of virtue for the sake of auspicious deeds. In that pure land surrounded by snowy mountains, you are the source of all benefit and happiness. All powerful Abhagateshvara Tenzin Jatsu, may you stay until samsara's end. Ngong ri ra we go re jin yon di ven on de wa ma lu jong we ne jen re zi won den zin yo zu yi ja be zi de ba du den yo ji mi me ze we de jen jen re zi ji me jen be wan bo jan be yan de bo ma Jones is on with the Ganjang Gibe Zojan Zonga Balos on Rabi Jala So the guy may was, who I may want, or I may was, or is it he may brushes over comes with me. Get him cheer and cool room, ha ha ha, oh, Bagavan Sava, Data got up in some moment, Benzabava Mahasamaya Sapa, ah, home, Ved. In all our lives, may we never be separated from Kensu Geshe Wandak, whatever form he or she chooses to show us, whether it's the emanation body uh, in the ordinary worlds or in the enjoyment body when we become Arya Bodhisattvas. We, may we never separate from this perfect teacher. And when we become Buddhists, may we help him or her to bring all sentient beings to the state free of suffering and bliss. Thank you so much, everyone. I, I appreciate all of you. I hope you uh, uh, like the change up. <laughs> we were able to get through some uh, information. It's not to say that we won't be doing the guided meditation we always do. Uh, before class uh, anymore, uh, but we will switch it up sometimes, and I think that it's beneficial uh, to do so. So uh, I hope that it was beneficial for your mind, it was beneficial for my mind, 
uh, and we will see each other next. What is today? Uh, today's Thursday night, so mo- on Sunday. Oh, that's oh a time change. Dun, 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 I'll be texting this out, this info, uh, <laughs> new facts on deck. Um, class on Sundays is going to be at 11 now. Um, only an hour. Uh, it's going to be an hour later, and we'll go 11 to 12. Uh, we won't go two hours. It'll be only an hour long. Um, then maybe some uh, other people who can't join us because they're sleeping <laughs> will be up. Uh, so just joking around. But um, yeah, we'll start at 11. My class at the Tibet House, um, it goes was going uh, starting at 8. Um, and going till like 10, but Geshe Dorje Damdu goes over a lot. Sometimes, you know, half hour we know. Um, and then they just announced today uh, that class is going to start a half hour later. Uh, so then it would be 10.30 if with all going right, two hours in. Um, and I can always leave the class right at the cusp of the end if he were to go over much, much longer. Um, but I think that 11 o'clock makes it more realistic Um, And, you know, even if I have to just literally like turn the camera from, you know, one direction to the other direction and start teaching, that's fine with me. But I want to make sure that I don't miss any of Geshe Dorje Damdu's teaching. So uh, Sunday will be at 11. I know it's going to take a minute to get used to, but I will personally text message everybody uh, and let you know that um, so that it reminds you and goes ding uh, in your head. So uh, that's the news of the week. And uh, I'll see you all on Sunday at 11 a.m. And when the time changes, we may be able to do something, but I I don't know how that all works. All right. (laughs) See you next time.